Amen. Give it up for Christy. She did a great job. Man, so excited to be with you guys today. I want to welcome Pastor Dan is in the midst with us. Pastor Dan oversees our One Focus Network, the family of churches that we're a part of. It's about 40 churches we're a part of together, and um, honored to have him here today. I'm going to share a little bit more abbreviated message. Pastor Dan's going to give us an update, and then I'll close us today. And uh, one of my favorite weeks of the year is when I get to go to Pastor Dan's hometown in Spearfish, South Dakota. We, it's called the Pastoral Training Intensive. It's about 15 other pastors that come. And so we do two sessions a day, learning, growing together, having fun, and then we do an activity. And um, I'm here today to let you guys know that I'm the reigning champion in archery. Two years in a row. And listen, something came against me this year. Pastor Dan tried to team up the best players against me. Didn't work. The spirit of the Lord was upon me. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Look at these guys. Not for the faint of heart. So um, he's down by 20 points, looking 40 yards down the lane. Said this prayer, Lord, I'm, I'm in the pit of despair. Would you rescue me? And boom, three bullseyes in a row. All, God, God will do uh, miracles among us. And so um, the, in other news, last year I also won in skeet shooting. So don't let this 5-7 frame fool you guys. If this election goes sideways, you want me on your survival team. I will carry you through. Awesome. All right, let's turn to Joshua chapter 1. I want to talk about crossing over. So here's Israel. They're a nomadic tribe having left Egypt. And they're being led by a cloud by day and a fire by night. They're being fed supernaturally with manna and quail. And Moses passes away. And now it's time for Joshua to take the Israelites across into the promised land. Man, this is just such an exciting story. You can just put this on, put it on the, you know, the audible and, and play through it. It's just a great story. I've been in Joshua a lot this year and just want to pull some, some nuggets and some thoughts uh, this morning. Joshua 1 verse 3 says, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Now, I already got excited about that. It reminds me of Psalm 2.8. It says, Ask, and I will give you the nations as an inheritance for you. Did you know that there is authority where you put your feet? Where you go, you carry the spirit of the Lord, and you carry an atmosphere. You are bringing the kingdom of God wherever you go. I say this prayer a lot. Lord, everywhere we put our feet, Lord, we're just taking ground. We just had a, a missions team in China. And I said, Lord, everywhere they place their feet, Lord, we just, we just want to take back the territory that the enemy is wanting to claim. How many of you know, oh, that was a real grunty. How many of you know, I'm getting fired up here. How many of you know that the enemy is constantly trying to take and steal our ground and our authority? It's constant. I looked at the video of our open door thing in the morning, and this guy is out there ranting and raving for 30 minutes, cursing the church of the Lord. Can you believe that? On our property, not on my watch. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Satan is to be a footstool for Jesus. He is under our feet. All rule, all reign, all power, all authority has been given to us. So when I'm on that property, I'm walking that property line, just saying, Jesus, this is our territory. Do you know when you sign a lease, you have authority in that place? There is ownership there. I love that we're spread all over Hampton Roads. We're taking ground. I love that we're in different neighborhoods because you have authority in your neighborhood. Take a hold of that authority and let Jesus work and move in your midst. There's another nugget here I love. It says, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Did you catch that? The promises of Moses got passed to Joshua. Man, that's good news. The promises of God, they're generational. It's like a seed that keeps multiplying. One day, hopefully, I get a good 30-year run here at Big House. If I retire in my 70s, 
all the promises of God spoken over me and over Big House, they're going to pass to the next pastor. That's good. God's promises don't stop with one person. They're for the people of God, and they will continue. Everything spoken over Overdoor Chapel, guess what? That's getting passed to us. There are ancient wells of revival that we get to steward that Open Door has been fostering for many, many years. I can't wait to be at the new property and see that sanctuary rebuilt because the glory of the Lord is going to enter the temple again, and we're going to be a resting place for God's presence on Virginia Beach Boulevard. Can I hear an amen? amen. All right, verse 5, kind of going on this story. So we're unpacking that basically Joshua is getting marching orders to start to move into the promised land. Verse 5, God is continuing to say, no one will be able to stand against you, Joshua, all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You can trust me. We're together. Verse 6, he says, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land. I swore to their ancestors to give them. God is coming through on his promises and his inheritances for the people of Israel. He says, be strong and courageous. Why? Because this is a little bit uncharted, scary territory. They've got a lot of battles ahead of them. Where we're heading, it's going to take courage and it's going to take strength. It's going to take being committed to obeying the voice of the Lord. The things God has, has declared for you, uh, the God things are always bigger than we can handle on our own. In our weakness, he is what? Strong. Trust him in what he's called you to do. Lord, we just ask for you to open up the floodgates of heaven over the prophetic words and promises over the lives in this room right now in Jesus' name. Skip into verse 10, he says, so Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Pack your stuff up. We're moving forward. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving for you to own. He's saying this, I want you to prepare physically. I want you to pack your things I want you to make sure that your material possessions, everything that you need to move forward is ready. Here's a question for you. How do you need to get ready? Are you ready for revival to break out? I'm believing that there's going to be a great end time revival and we are going to be a part of stewarding God's manifest presence poured out on earth. We got to wake up. We got to get ready. We got to prepare. And for us, materialistically, physically, there's things that we can do. You know, Christy and I, uh, we built this big deck in our backyard because we greatly desire for people to be able to host people at our house. So last week, we had our whole staff, spouses, kids, and elders over. So almost 55 people at our house. It was incredible. But there was a preparation ahead of time that we had to do to be able to be able to invite and welcome those people in. So I want to encourage you, think about what you need to do to prepare. Could be as simple as working on your calendar and organizing it and creating more space in your day to be ready for what God's doing. For us, revival starts with family in the home. So Christy and I do a date night every single Wednesday night. Come on, somebody. Uh, that's hard. That's costly. And I want to I want to encourage you marriages fight for moments to be together. Other thing we do is every other week we do a extended family night because some of you maybe have realized this that you can live in the same town and not see each other for a month or two, and we realized we want to make sure family is tight and together. So those are things we're doing to make sure we're we're preparing. Okay, so Joshua in chapter two sends two spies out and he's checking out Jericho and seeing what the plan should be. Verse 24, the spies come back and they said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given the whole land into your hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. That's got to feel good, huh? A lot of confidence going into the promised land. Moving to chapter 3, verse 3, early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites, actually verse 1, set out to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went through the camp, giving orders to the people. 
When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubics. That's uh, did a little number crunching there. It's about a mile and a half, 0.56 miles. Stay back because you, you, you've never been this way before, and we want to go ahead of you. Uh, and the, keep that ark ahead of you, and don't go near it. Joshua told the people, hear this, everyone, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. As soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Scholars say that it was anywhere from two to three million people that crossed over this river. Joshua starts in chapter one and say, I want you to physically prepare, get your things in order. And then in chapter three, he says, now I want you to consecrate yourselves. I want you to be spiritually ready. Saw something interesting here. And if I find it in my notes, I'll tell you. There seems to be a correlation between God doing amazing things among us and the act of consecration. This is what I don't want to happen for our community, is that we physically prepare and we just go from one physical building to the next physical building. We would miss all that God wants to do in the spirit in our lives. God is doing a great work right now. What he has prepared for us is going to take consecration and dedication and devotion. It's going to take us growing and being equipped for the good works he has prepared for us. We're going to need all hands on deck, and it's going to be the most beautiful experience as God begins to grow and multiply our community. I'm so excited for that, and I want to make sure that we're doing the preparation that we need to do physically and spiritually. You guys with me on that? All right, so how do we consecrate ourselves unto the Lord, and, and what are some practical things that we can start doing right now as a community? First thing is spiritual preparation, really a definition of that would be to be set apart, to say, Lord, I'm, I'm creating space from the world, the flesh, and the devil, and I'm connecting my heart to you and setting myself apart in a way that says, I am being reserved for the work of the Lord, not for any other, other reason. Every other God is an idol. I don't want to, I don't want to, and, and, and in my life right now, the Lord has just said, hey, this is a, it's not wrong. All things are permissible. Maybe not all things are beneficial. There's things as I've moved into this new season that, that the things that were, were, were not a big deal in a previous season, they're a no-go anymore. It's not for me. I need to be set apart for the next thing. Yeah. Second is that acknowledge that we're dealing with a holy God, holy and righteous and pure. There's no one like him. He wants to perform miracles in our midst. Let's not take this moment lightly. Let's really you know, sometimes you're like, man, God just does, God just is always doing crazy wild things. It's like, no, actually, let's stop and think about it. We were, a $6 million property was given to us. That's unbelievable. That's something to shout about. We've raised almost $3 million. That's incredible. God is making a way for us to take the land, the inheritance that he's given for us. There's a correlation with consecration and what, what is called the spiritual disciplines. Um, there's an idea of, I'll just, I'll just unpack it. So there's a book I love called um, Under the Unpredictable Plant by Eugene Peterson. And he talks about this word, this Greek word called ascesis. It's, it's an appropriate training regiment for the task ahead of you. 
So we need an appropriate training regiment to spiritually engage in what God's called us to. My journey is not your journey. What works for me is not going to necessarily work for you. It might be different. Imagine a missionary versus a pastor versus somebody going in the marketplace. The, the training regimen is probably going to look a little bit different for each person. I would say find the one that fits the call of God in your life. Um, so Richard Foster wrote a great book called Celebration of Discipline, and he gives us an idea of how to move forward in a little bit of that training regimen that can help us grow and be strengthened as Christians. I hear this a lot as a pastor. Pastor Matt, I just feel like I'm not hearing God right now. I feel like a praying is just like an iron dome above me, and I'm just, I just, I feel like I was close with the Lord in past seasons, but I'm just struggling right now. I'm just, I'm just trying a lot of stuff, but just no breakthrough. Here's the key: the spiritual disciplines. Press in. Be proactive. Don't sit on your hands. Say, okay, Lord, how can I begin to move forward? And sometimes you don't have clear examples of like the Lord's not speaking every next step. But here are things I know if you will do these things, God will begin to open your eyes to help you grow in what he's calling you to do. So here's some inward disciplines from Celebration of Discipline that that we can activate. Spiritual, biblical meditation. Meditating on the word of God. Meditating on, on who he is. Prayer. This is a set apart, scheduled time and season of prayer. This is, I am setting apart 30 minutes to an hour or more every single day, and I'm pressing in like an Olympian training for the Olympics would press in to a training session. Fasting. Study. Maybe you get a study book, and you're just pressing in with a, with, a, with, a, with a Bible study book. That can create breakthrough in our lives. Here's an outward discipline that can be helpful. Simplicity. Anybody got five kids and, and love some simplicity? Thank you, Jesus. Solitude. We live in the busiest world. Phone pinging all the time. Just, just everywhere you go, there's something to distract you. Take a walk in the woods and just experience solitude, being alone with Jesus. What about submission? Woo, that's a, that's, that's a tough one, right? Lord, I'm just going to submit to what you're speaking to me in my life right now. How many of you have known the Lord has spoken for you to do something, and you've just been putting it off, putting it off, putting it off? There's a season to say, Lord, I'm just, I'm submitting. I'm laying it all down, doing everything that you're asking me to do. Service. Just get out and serve. Find a way to volunteer. Find a way to jump in. Look for an opportunity to give back and to bless and serve someone else. Here are corporate, corporate disciplines that can benefit us as a community. Confession. There's been some real beautiful confession that's taken place on this stage where people have come and said, this is what I'm going through. I'm confessing this, and it's just caused just, just a, a, a chain reaction of people getting breakthrough. Sometimes we need to see uh, what someone else has been through to get the faith to know that we can also get breakthrough in that too. Worship. We do that well, but sometimes um, if we're not careful, we can just kind of like, I got worship music on at all times. There's something about saying, I am pressing in, in worship on my own time. Not because it's convenient or I'm just moving from one thing to the next thing, but I'm going to carve out this time to be with Jesus and worship him. Guidance, getting guidance on what to do next and celebration. Isn't that a fun one? I love celebrating. So we'll celebrate today from 1 to 3 p.m. at Open Door. Get a hot dog. Christy's not cooking them, but she'll serve them to you and uh, take all the credit. Watch out for her. (laughs) We are using our grill today, so they're going to be charred incredibly well. (laughs) Trust us. Kind of coming in for a landing here right now, but I I just want to set your hearts in expectation that God isn't just moving our community to a new building. He wants to do mighty signs, wonders, and miracles among us. He wants us to grow and develop and be ready and prepared to receive all that he wants to do in Hampton Roads. It is going to be the time of our lives. It's going to be the most fun we've ever had together as a church community. 
The other thing is this was a corporate fast. This is corporate consecration. There's something that takes place when we join together as a community and say we're going together. There's an anointing and there's a blessing that comes. Uh, Psalm 139, right? Blessed are those who dwell together in unity. It's like the oil pouring down from Aaron's beard. We get to experience that together, that unity and that blessing from the Lord. So Israel is moving from a wilderness nomadic tribe type people and they're crossing over into the promised land. Everything about, in a lot of ways, their culture is shifting. Food is delivered to them. They're in the wilderness, cloud by day, fire by night. And they've got tents that they're packing up and moving around. And now as they cross the Jordan River, guess what happens? They don't need the manna anymore. They don't need the quail anymore. They don't need the fire by day and the cloud by night. They have transitioned and crossed over to the next phase. Did the DNA vision of the people of Israel change? No. But the context and the culture of where they were began to shift. So they had to take that DNA and they had to transfer it to the next place. That's what Big House is, is we're doing right now. I've never led services uh, weekly in a thousand seat sanctuary. We probably won't have a thousand seats every week, probably like 800 to 600. We probably will do two services because we really value intimacy and the prophetic together. That can be a little harder with a thousand people, right? If you remember, he says, follow the ark because you don't know which way you're going. Here's the truth. We don't know every single next step of what it's going to look like. But if we will follow the presence of the Lord, he will lead us to the next place. And that is great news. We don't have to worry. We don't have to stress about it. He's going to show us the way. Show us how to do it the big house way in a new context, in a new space and place. We have an incredibly high value for ministry time. But the physical space we're in right now makes it incredibly challenging. What it's caused in our hearts is a blossoming, great, incredible expectation for a release of ministry time at our next location. We love the creative arts and we love dance. Any dancers in the room? This is not a, this is not a great room for it. Listen, I have seen conga lines break out at big house events. Have you ever been caught in a conga line on Sunday? It's unbelievable. What about the, uh, the circles of people dancing in a circle? You know, you ever done that before? You just get pulled right in, you know? You ever been pulled into one before? You're like, how long can I sustain this? You know, just, just cry out to the Lord for strength as you, as you dance like David danced. So I just, um, was anybody here last week when Selena came up in the middle of worship and danced? Oh my gosh, it was, you can't plan that. You can't choreograph that. It was breathed of the spirit. One of our elders, Pat, was like, you know, I was kind of engaging worship and he said, Selena came and he's just, I started bawling. Just the presence of the Lord. Oh, it, this is a community. It's, it's, it's not about me. It's not about the worship team. It's about us together, what the Lord's doing. We need each other. I need people to break out and dance and to give prophetic words because it releases something in us and through us. And I just, I know if we will continue to follow the voice of the Lord, he's going to reveal his heart to us, in us, and through us as we cross over. So here's what I'm asking you to do. Prepare physically. Get ready to host a small group. Clean that bonus room. Let's get ready, you know? And then let's walk into a season of consecration. Maybe one of those spiritual disciplines stood out to you. Give it a shot. Three weeks. Spiritual disciplines are not for every day for the rest of time. That's, that will turn into legalism. But set a time frame, a start and an end, and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try this solitude thing. I'm going to try prayer. Um, prayer in a way that, that fits in that spiritual discipline category. The book is Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline. You're going to love it. All right. In closing, I just, um, just want to say I'm so excited for what the Lord's doing at Big House. God is in control. He said, 
Jesus said, I will build my house. He will not let the gates of hell prevail against it. I'm so grateful for what the Lord's doing in us and through us, and I just have great, great confidence for us as a church community and what the Lord's doing in us. Amen? Amen. Amen.